the discovery of orientation tuning in individual neurons in visual cortex was one of the most important and paradigm-shifting findings in the history of neuroscience. And in this video, you will get to see what orientation tuning looks like in a real data set. So it's a pretty exciting video. By the end of this video, you are going to produce graphs that look something like this. So in this plot, we see a histogram that shows on the x-axis the orientation of the stimulus in degrees. And on the y-axis, we see the average spike count. So this is average over all uh, 200 stimulus repetitions. And then we are going to write a little algorithm that can identify the maximum response, so the peak response across this histogram, and then put that into the title of this graph. So it's not visually super obvious that it's 270, but I guess the response here is a little bit higher than 90 degrees. Now, a brief aside on terminology. Having a preference for something is uh, an agentic characteristic. So I have preferences, you have preferences, your neighbor's dog has a preference. A single brain cell doesn't really have a preference. It would be more scientifically accurate to say that this unit, this neuron, is maximally tuned to stimuli with an orientation of 270 degrees. But colloquially, we often say that the neuron prefers this particular type of stimulus. And I'm also gonna use this as an opportunity to show you how to integrate quotation marks into titles and also how to integrate a little bit of LaTeX coding to get this degree symbol up here. Now, from this histogram, it might seem strange that this neuron has a biphasic response. However, keeping in mind that orientations are actually circular, we can also visualize the same data in a polar plot. And that's what you see over here on the right. Now, when you see the data plotted in this way, it's clear that this neuron is tuned towards any stimulus that is vertically oriented, regardless of whether that motion is upwards or downwards. Now, when you make this plot, there are these two plots in MATLAB, it's, they're not going to look exactly like what you see here on the screen. And that is because we are going to randomly select a neuron to show data from. So when I made this screenshot, my code randomly selected the 30th neuron in the list. So each time you run the code, you're going to see results from a different randomly selected neuron. Okay, so I hope that's enough explanation. It's now time to switch to MATLAB. Of course, if you would like to pause the video, work through some code on your own, then please do so now. The first thing that we are going to do is pick a neuron at random. Now MATLAB comes with many built-in functions for generating random numbers. In this case, I believe that the most relevant, the most useful function is randi, which generates a random integer. So we're going to generate a random integer between one and n neurons. Remember, this is a variable that we created a few videos ago. So in this particular case for this data set, we have 106 neurons. And then the second input is gonna be one, and that's just gonna say that you know we want one number between one and n neurons. So let's see what this one happens to be. It happens to be 87. Of course, there's nothing special about 87. When I run this code again, we get 97. Let's see if we get, oh, we couldn't get 107 there. That's, that would be bigger than n neurons. Okay, so, so you can see this is going to generate a new random neuron for us to analyze. Now what we want to do is actually compute the data. So we want uh, the average spike count over all of the trials per gradient, per stimulus orientation. So remember that comes from data matrix total spike count. And then what we want is to access the random unit, random unit that we just generated here. And then we want all of the stimulus orientations and all of the trials. Now this is going to be uh, a two-dimensional matrix because this will give us all the orientations and all of the trials. But we want to average over all of the trials. So we use the mean function. And now as the second input into the mean function, I'm going to write three. And three is the right answer here. It's the right number to put in the second input to the mean function because we want to average over the third dimension. The first dimension is the neurons. Then we have the orientation and then we have the trials. So let's make sure that this is going to be a vector with 12 numbers. It should be 12 numbers corresponding to the 12 different orientations. 
All right, very good. So then we need to find the maximum response. So the right function is max, and then we get the, the maximum of this, but this notation here is totally wrong. So first of all, we need to put the outputs. So we want multiple outputs from the max function. So we have to encase them in square brackets like this. And then this is only the first output, max val. What we want is max, I'll call this max resp for maximum response. So the first output is going to be the actual value of the largest output, which is 15.46. But what we also want to know is which orientation had that maximum response. So we can see by, let me dump this out into the command window. We can see that the largest number here is indeed 15.4, and that's what max val tells us. But we also need to know which element corresponding to which uh, stimulus orientation had the maximum response. All right, very good. Moving along. Now it's time to visualize the data. What I'm doing here is specifying the x-axis coordinates. So this is going to be the uh, gradient orientation. And you can see that we go from 0 to 330 in steps of 30. So we are going from 0, skipping by 30, and then going up to 330. And then I create a, a figure. So this is a figure with a subplot geometry of 5 by 1. So that means it's going to be five rows and one column. And now I'm going to be plotting this bar graph into the space that's occupied by these three rows, so rows two through four. So this is just one way to have a little bit of uh, control over the size of your graph. So let's see, let's run all of this code. And I think most of this should, should run. Yep, here we go. So we see that unit number 14. So this is quite different from the example that I showed in the slides. This neuron does not seem to have a really strong preference. Maybe a bit of a preference here, maybe a little bit of a preference here. But to be honest, this also looks like it could be no preference and just a little bit of noise. Okay, and then I also want to show you how I'm creating the title here. So I'm concatenating strings and uh, numbers that are converted into strings. So we have to convert the numbers into strings with this function num to string. And then the single quotes are for the uh, characters that get uh, printed here. And then I have the double quotes printed here. So it's really easy to get double quotes in here. Finally, at the end, I have a little bit of LaTeX coding. So if you're familiar with LaTeX coding, then this kind of notation will look familiar. And if you're not familiar with LaTeX coding, it's basically just a way to get uh, some nice looking mathematical notation printed in, uh, in a figure. So we have this caret symbol here, which indicates that we want a superscript. And then the slash circ is for this little circle that appears after the 330 degree. And then the dollar signs are letting MATLAB know that this is LaTeX code. And then we need to use the LaTeX interpreter. Okay, now this graph is kind of okay, except this is not the real orientation here. The orientation was not actually 1 through 12 degrees, but instead it was 0 through 330 degrees. So let's see, we're going to make the figure look a little bit nicer. So we're going to set the font size to be 14. So that just makes the font a little bit bigger. This is for get current figure. So we can see, you know, here we're changing the axis properties. Here I'm changing the figure properties. And I'm setting the figure color to be magenta. That's, okay, maybe that's, you know, I, I think maybe white is a little bit more professional. Although the magenta does look pretty neat. Okay, now I also want to change the x-axis tick marks. So I'm going to change x tick label to the gradient, gradient orientation variable that I set uh, a few moments ago. Very nice. So this produces our bar graph. And now we are ready to draw the same data in a polar plot. So let's see. So we're going to put that in figure three. And then we're going to use this function polar plot, where we provide two inputs. The first one is the angle or the theta. And the second input is the row or the distance away from the origin. So let's see what this figure looks like. Hmm, this somehow doesn't look quite right. That's what this comment here says. It's not quite what we expect. Let's look at the help file for polar plot. Let's type help polar plot. And let's read a little bit about this function. So this tells us, so this is what I already told you. So vector th for theta and r for rho. 
and the values in theta are in radians. Aha! This is is wrong. So what we the code that we wrote here is wrong because the, we gave these vector orientations or these stimulus gradient orientations in degrees, not in radians. So in fact, we need to convert this from degrees to radians. And then I hope that will look better. I'm also using this as an opportunity to add some additional features to this plot just to make the lines look a little bit nicer. Okay, so let's see what this polar plot looks like. Ah, this looks much better. And in fact, here you see even more clearly than in the bar plot that this neuron doesn't really have a particular orientation tuning. Maybe a little bit of a tuning over here, but that could also just be some a little bit of noise. Okay, now it looks like we're missing a line here. So what I want to do is adapt the code so that this line or this dot, this marker here connects to this marker. So the way that I'm going to do that is by creating new vectors, a new gradient orientation and a new average spikes vector such that there's going to be an additional final point, final data point that overlaps with the first data point. So this is the first data point. We come around here with the vector. This is the last data point. I'm going to add a new last data point to these two vectors, which is exactly a copy of this first data point. And that's what's going to make this circular. It will draw a line back to the beginning. Okay, and so I'm also going to use some different variable names here so that I'm not going to overwrite any of the variables that we've already created. So this is going to be, I'm going to use concatenation here. So it's going to be degree to radian and then the gradient orientation. So this gives me the original vector and then I need to just repeat this for the first element of gradient orient. So just like this with the first element in here. Actually looking at this code now, I see that we could change this a little bit. So we can do gradient orient like this and then repeat the first element and then we string concat. So we're just saving ourselves a little bit of text here. So I hope this makes sense what I'm doing here. I have the entire uh, orientation vector and then I'm repeating the first element and then those get concatenated and then I convert them into radians. So here you see we go from zero up to 330 and then back to zero. So this gives us our variable th, which is theta. And then for the radians, for r, that's going to be pretty much the same concept, except it's a different variable. So this is going to be average spikes and then average spikes again and only the first element. And then I will copy and paste this code here. Now we don't need all of this business. This is just th and this is just r. Now you can also see this is, you know, this ended up being a really long line of code. So I use the three dots here, the ellipse, three periods to continue on to the next line. And I'm not so sure that that's still necessary here because now this line of code isn't quite so long. Okay, so let's run this again. And, uh, oops, I have to run this code here. And there we go. Now this gives us the stimulus orientation tuning for one randomly selected neuron. What if we want to see what the tuning looks like and what the spike count rates look like over all the neurons distributed over our 10 by 10 grid? That's coming up in the next video.